What's going on, everybody? And welcome back to yet another edition of our series here, The Expert's Guide to Betting here on the Action Network. Today, we're doing The Expert Guide to Betting Major League Baseball. And who better to have to learn how to fish, as I always say, than our guys, Sean Zarillo and BJ Cunningham. What's going on, guys? How are you? Doing well, Dan. Thank you for having me. Happy to talk some MLB betting advice because this sport could be excruciating to bet on. So maybe we can give tips to help people make it a little bit more enjoyable. No, yeah, absolutely. it's a long, it's a long season here. And uh, we're just hoping to help people out over that long stretch and hopefully at the end of the season, be up some money. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Everybody that I talk to who bets baseball talks about it as a marathon, not a sprint. Talks about it as a grind kind of every day for six months having to do this. So I guess the first thing I got to ask you guys both is, what actually makes you an expert in being able to ride this grind and be profitable? Like, guys, how long have you been doing this? And, and how have you managed to kind of be on the black side of the ledger? Well, I started out 14, 15 years ago, which makes me sound like an old man at this point, but I was in high school. And the first thing that caught my eye was home run futures, betting hmm. players to lead the league in home runs, seeing that long shot odds. It's kind of like betting golf futures where you get that that tote board with all those long prices, it's like betting first round leader or top player in a group, top tens, things like that. So you can actually, this is something I always encourage people to do. Betting different sports kind of gives you an insight into what it's like to bet on other sports where betting golf futures has led me to having more success betting on baseball futures. So eventually over time, I wanted to learn how to bet the sport on a day-to-day -day basis because everybody always told me it was unprofitable, not worth my time. Anything could happen at a baseball game. And while that is true, I built a model in late 2018, started using it for the 2019 season when I was contributed for action. And there were ups and downs to be sure, but we've had multiple successful, profitable seasons. I have over 7,000 baseball bats tracked in the Action Network app at this point, have over 2,100 bets midway through the 2022 20, season. So it is a lot of volume, a lot of consistency, but over that time, I basically built up a hand sample, like playing thousands of poker hands where I know what I'm good at, what I need to adjust, where I can improve. Yeah. I mean, my story is kind of similar to Sean. So I started betting pretty much every sport, but especially baseball in about 2011 when I was a freshman in college, uh, really just, I would played baseball in my life and was just really interested in seeing if it could be profitable from a long run standpoint. And, you know, first off, I didn't know what models were projections were back then. Right. And I, similar to Sean around 2015, 2016, when I was an accountant and I finally learned how to use Excel, I started building out a projection model based on base runs after reading a book called trading bases, uh, which really intrigued me and got me kind of down this path of, of using projections, not only for baseball, but for every single sport. Uh, and really treating baseball as kind of an investment strategy rather than just a gambling strategy that over the long run, if you're consistently betting things that have expected value, well, in the long run, you're going to end up making money. Now, that's not going to be true from maybe even a fully season standpoint. You know, I've had even the last few seasons, I've been down a little bit, but over the long run, I have made a profit betting baseball. So, you know, I, I know that as we go further and further into the future, if I consistently keep betting things that have expected value based on, you know, a projection model that has shown that it can make money over time, then, you know, I, I'm going to keep betting the support on a daily basis and just ride the waves, the, the downswings and the upswings. Uh, I mean, so, so the bona fides are clearly there. And I love the way you guys kind of describe it as having your own model, but then it kind of getting honed over time. It's like me playing blackjack. Eventually, I just know what to do when I have an 11 facing a six, right? And so you get a little bit more comfortable over time. But you guys talk about how hard it is. Let's start from the beginning. Like, what are some of the basics that people will have to learn to try to be profitable in this market? What are some of the fun foundational pillars you need to know? I mean, one of the things I think of guys is, I mean, you're going to have to be comfortable betting on some pretty bad teams. Even the worst teams in the league may win only 55, 60, 65 games a year. But if they're doing that at plus 235 in those 63 wins, then that's really profitable, right? So Sean, what are some of the kind of like pillars here for someone trying to actually start to bet baseball yeah for me price is everything you kind of mentioned it dane i don't care my, what my winning percentage is at the end of the year now i know over time if i'm winning about 49 percent of my bets i'm doing well if i'm winning 45 percent, i'm breaking even if i'm losing 
60% of my bets. If I'm only winning 40% of my bets, I'm probably having a down period. So I need to win about 45% of the time to break even at the average odds that I'm betting. But that being said, price is everything. Absolutely everything. I don't care if you think the Yankees are 75% likely to win tonight. That may be the case. But if you're giving me odds saying that the team who they're facing, if I project them at 25%, if you're saying that they're only going to win 20% of the time, if you're giving me plus 400 on a line that I have projected closer to plus 300, I'm going to bet that every single time. I may not win tonight, may not win tomorrow, but in a three-game series over the course of a season, I know I'm expecting to come out ahead at some point. I may win 30 out of those 100 bets where you say the market says I'm only going to win 25 out of 100. So I'll take those five wins take those onto my profit line. And as we said, grind out a profit. If I win a third of a unit every day across an entire season, I'm going to be up 60 units out of the end of the year. So if I just generate that plus money, generate that small return on my investment, $3 back for every $100 I'm putting down. So 103 back for every $100 I'm putting down. I think eventually I'm going to come out ahead. So price is everything for me, but you really have to get comfortable betting on ugly things, ugly underdogs against good teams, betting overs, in games between two good pitchers, betting unders in games between two bad pitchers. You have to find the things that nobody else wants to bet. That's generally where you're going to find your value and you have to stick to your price targets and don't go beyond those. No, it's really, like you said, talking about inching it up the hill in some way. BJ, what about you? You know, especially if someone who is new to this game, trying to bet baseball, what would be some of the things you would tell them right out the gate? Well, I, to Sean's point, I mean, I totally agree with him. Expected value is is everything. You know, con- if we want to bet things that have a better percentage chance of winning than what the market's offering. So to Sean's example, you know, if I have somebody projected at plus 150, well, the implied odds on that is around 40% and the market is offering plus 175, well, that's 36.36%. I'm getting, you know, close to a little over three and a half percent a value on that. So if I continually bet that over and over, yes, like Sean said, I might, might not win tonight. It might not win tomorrow, but over the long run, that's going to generate a small percentage of a profit. And when when you're betting a sport like baseball and there's so many games to bet on, it's easier to see that long run profit happen rather than betting football where, you know, you have 16 weeks out of the year and that's it. So betting baseball is obviously very a long run game. Another thing I would tell people is to, if you're handicapping baseball, remove general statistics like batting average, mm. ERA, and RBIs from any of your handicapping because in today's age, they don't mean anything. What and so This is more specifically in sports betting in general. We're not betting on what's happened in the past. We're trying to bet on what's going to happen in the future, essentially the game in front of us. So using expected indicators like expected ERA, expected FIP, expected weighted on base average, expected batting average, all of these things are much more useful and much more predictive of what a team or especially a pitcher is going to be in the long run. So for, let's just take, for example, there's a game in the middle of the season between the Orioles and the Cubs. Orioles had Spencer Watkins on the mound. The Cubs had Justin Steele. If you look at everything on paper, Spencer Watkins has around a 3.90 ERA. Justin Steele is around 4.1. Well, if we dig into those expected indicators, Well, Spencer Watkins has drastically been overperforming his metrics, and he's around a 5.4 expected ERA, while Justin Steele is underperforming, where his expected ERA is around 3.3. So you're getting almost like a two-run difference between starting pitchers that on paper look very similar. So it's situations like that where you can generate a profit, and then price point is everything. On that same game, you know the Cubs opened at minus 125, and then they close at minus 150 because people see those type of regression stats that are going to happen. So getting those lines early, getting them at the best possible price point that you can. You know, if you follow Sean in the app, he always gives you the price point of where he's going to stop betting it. So yeah, if you can see that and you can bet it within that price range, you know, again, like we've mentioned over the long run, you will be able to at least in theory, turn a profit. Now it might not be one year, but over a long run of two, three years. Yeah. You're absolutely you know, the right. mathematically the checks out that really you're love. going to profit. Yeah, one of the things I really love, Sean, that you do in the app, you know, and and BJ just mentioned it, is when you make a play, you know, the line might be, you know, minus 165, and you'll say bet it to minus 145, you know, or whatever the case may be for that specific bet, giving people kind of the actual range of when this is still valuable to do up until what markers. So we really like that. And Sean, you know, you also mentioned earlier the idea of, you know, betting on other sports to kind of hone your craft as well. But what... What is actually unique to betting 
baseball, you know, or major league baseball, where the saying always is, right? Momentum is the name of tomorrow's starting pitcher. We have so many markets besides the, just the side and the total. We have first five markets to bet, which are really unique to the game where you can isolate the bullpen or the starting pitcher. And then to be quite honest, the thing I always ask every day during the summer, if the Cubs are at home, is what direction is the wind blowing out? So that's a really interesting feature that doesn't necessarily happen in other sports. What are some of the things that maybe unique to betting Major League Baseball? Yeah, as you mentioned, weather at certain parks is completely dramatic and can totally influence the total being at 11 and a half versus seven and a half at Wrigley Field, whether it's blowing out or in. Wrigley, one of the more dramatic ones for that. But whether the roof is closed at certain parks too in Arizona or in Texas can really influence the total as well. They the should park- have closed the roof in ninth inning of game <laughs> seven in 2001. First of all, that's why they spent a million dollars for the roof. And you got a little strip there going, you know, whatever. I digress. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sean. No, I mean, and it happens in the middle of the game sometimes where in Arizona, they'll open the roof or they'll shut the roof and the run environment will completely change. You may have a bet on an over or an under going into the game that look good. And you bet it based upon the dynamics of the stadium going into that matchup. And then the stadium environment may change in the middle of the game. But these teams play, these games play out completely differently at different parks. You look at a park like Oakland, which is massive foul ground territory. Well, they tend to acquire a lot of starting pitchers who generate pop-ups because they're going to get a lot of free outs with balls and foul territory that would just go out of play at other parks. But one thing I will say and we talked about it being a grind, the time horizon is very short. There's basically 15 games every day, five out of the seven days out of the week. NBA, NHL, it's rare. I would say it's more rare that all the teams are playing in a given day. NFL, you're handicapping for two or three days per week as opposed to handicapping every single day. So to be prepared to make a lot of bets every day, to pick big positive and negative swings because you're probably going to have a lot of action on a particular day. And guessing the lineups can be where it's really difficult. Mm. You don't know if certain star players are going to be out. They may get announced out late. The lineups are only going to come out three, four hours before a game. So you're kind of guessing who's going to be in the lineup. Mike Trout may leave the lineup the night before getting hit or getting hit by pitch, getting hurt. So is he going to be in the lineup tomorrow? They're saying he's day to day. So you have to probably assume he's out. And then if he's in, you may have to adjust your projection on the fly and end up adjusting how you bet that game by on or off your position. And then on top of that, I think starting pitchers may influence lines for a game even more than quarterbacks influence a line for a football game. I think starting pitchers drive about 70% of the line for any MLB game. So who's the starting pitcher is going to be? It's very difficult for me to give you a line unless you tell me who the starting pitcher is going to be. And sometimes teams hold those back until a few hours before first pitch. So you're trying to hit moving targets very often with lineups, projecting lineups, projecting starting pitchers. One thing you can control seeing which relievers are rested, knowing which relievers might be rested coming into the game, which teams are willing to use certain relievers when they're ahead, when they're behind. So we'll talk about live betting in a bit, but all of that feeds into knowing your bullpens, knowing who's available and everything else. You're basically trying to hit moving targets with expected lineups. No, it's absolutely true. You know, you talked about injury, but I thought about that as well. Bullpen availability on a day-by-day basis. You talk about the starting pitcher. I mean, it's interesting. Sometimes the Dodgers are still minus 180 with TBD as their starter. But outside of that, you know, the starting pitcher obviously moves the needle. Hey, BJ, what about you? What are some of the things you look about that may be unique to betting baseball? Like some things, the schedule. I think matters. We have double headers in major league baseball where we don't have that in other sports. We've got the uh, day game after a night game getaway day on Wednesdays, midweek. How do some of these other kind of intricacies of the major league baseball schedule actually impact the way you bet baseball? Yeah. So it's speaking to Sean's point about how it's betting sports is very differently. So if you're betting a sport, you know, for example, like college football or NFL, what I'm doing throughout the week is I'm watching the market for Saturday and Sunday. So I'm trying to get the best possible line that I can, whether it be that on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever it is. Baseball, it's just a quick turnaround. So for me, I mean, I know Sean does this as well, but the night before I'm grinding projections, I'm trying to figure out, okay, which games or teams am I showing value on and which lines do I need to hit right now? Uh, it's what's very unique about baseball. You know, obviously we talk about the grind for four, five, you know, six months, but managing those type of swings and knowing that in the long run, you're going to be okay. is honestly kind of tough to handle. You know, I mean, I know Sean and myself have been going through a little bit of a downswing right now, but there'll be times 
where we'll be betting a ton of underdogs and they'll almost all hit for one night. I mean, the pirates swept the Dodgers this year in Los Angeles. That was one of the most profitable three game series. I think I've ever had in my life. The so, Orioles are above 500. The Orioles are above 500. Yeah. It just, it <laughs> over, it just baseball. There's so much unpredictably from a day to day basis. Um, but really, you know, it, what's, it's very unique is that it's just a grind more than anything else, because it's the only sport that like Sean said, we could get every single team playing for in a, in a given day for 162 games. No other league is playing that many games on a day-to-day basis. So these swings and these outcomes and everything are right there for the taking on a day-to-day basis. So it's, it's a difficult sport to kind of got, you know, steer the ship and try and manage and, and with a bankroll and everything like that. But, you know, if you're managing your bankroll correctly, you know, the, hopefully the swings aren't too, uh, hopefully the swings don't go too far to the pendulum to the right or the left uh, in terms of how much money you're winning or losing. Talking with BJ Cunningham and Sean Zarillo here. I'm Dane Martinez, the Spitting Statistician. This is another episode of the Expert's Guide to Betting here on the Action Network. You know, you guys are continuing to talk about the grind and your process. Take us a little bit into your process. And I guess it's a two-part thing, Sean. We'll start with you. You know, you talk about the projections on a day-to-day basis, but what about before the season, you know, uh, the winter meetings are done. Free agency is finished. You know, we finally have a work agreement, let's say, and there are no stoppages in any given season. Before the season starts, what are some of your processes maybe to index players, starting pitchers, teams, and the like? And then tell us a little bit about the day-to-day grind, as we've been calling it. Yeah, I think it's important to separate those two out because once the season starts, I kind of throw away my preseason process. I'm using my preseason process to project out how teams are going to play over the course of 162 games into the playoffs, trying to find value on futures, whether it's stat leaders, player awards, World Series futures, divisional odds. And I think there's a variety of resources that you can use to do that, whether you take my own projections and I use player projections that you can find publicly available to create my own win projections. But there are other sites who do that for you, like Fangraphs, Baseball Prospectus as Dakota, Davenport puts out his own standings projections. So you can take those projections, sort of combine them, create a composite. And if you're showing value on win totals across all three of those projections or averaging them out, if you're showing value on World Series futures or divisional futures across multiple of those systems, I would say there's a good chance there's actionable value on that number. You look at last year with the Brewers, both Fangraphs and Bacota, I believe, had the Brewers as a divisional favorite in the National League Central, not an odds-on favorite, but they had they both had them closer to about 40%, 45% coming into the season, and you were still getting around plus 300 plus 250s out there on the Brewers coming into the year, and they ended up running away with the division. And I had huge futures positions on the Brewers, 75 to 1 to win the World Series. Obviously, that didn't happen. By the time the playoffs got around, I could have easily hedged off of that number by betting series prices against them. So you take those composite projections from publicly available resources. I make my own, combine them all together, and you can usually find value across win totals, across preseason futures and whatnot. Same goes for player projections. I try to bucket guys based on where they are on leaderboards. My biggest player future this year was on Kyle Schwarber to Mm. lead the home run, uh, to lead the league in home runs coming into the year. He was bucketed on the leaderboard on the odds board with guys who were expected to hit about 25 to 30 home runs. Pretty much every projection system had him in that 35 to 40 home run range. So he should have been a top 10 to 15 home run hitter and preseason odd boards had him around 20 to 25 on the odds. Can I ask you a follow up on that though, Sean? You mentioned Mm -hmm. um, your process would say the Brewers, right? And I know a lot of people that going into this season, last season, last few seasons, have seen the NL Central and the AL Central as relatively weaker divisions, right? And so if you take the team that you think is going to win that division and at least be in the dance, because you're talking about their futures numbers and you talk about the opportunities to hedge maybe against them in the playoffs or bet against them game by game in the playoffs do you look for soft divisions like the al or nl central potentially to do that with even more well i think those divisions are certainly more wide open you know you you have a much likelier or much wider range of variance and who's going to end up winning that division and it's reflected in the odds you know the the dodgers are going to be minus money to win the nl west almost every year the brewers were actually minus money to win the nl central coming into this season but last year pretty much everybody was plus 200 or better 
to win the division. So I definitely like to target divisions where I think there's more variance in terms of there being an upset as opposed to trying to bet against the big favorite like the Dodgers. But again, it all comes back to price. It all comes down to price and where I see the projected number relative to the market. If I see two projection systems telling me that the Brewers are 40% likely to win a division or even coming into this year, two that were said that they were 80% likely to win the division, I can get them at minus 185 when they should be minus 400. I'm absolutely going to bet that projected gap in value as I perceive it. But basically, composite different projection systems that you see out there, try to find value relative to those. And I think that's a pretty good starting point to have your process, but then throw it away once the season starts, because you need to project these games on an individual basis. I don't care about trends. I think trends are largely overrated. They're very convenient to talk about saying teams are X and X at home and their last, whatever, all of that is irrelevant to me. What is the projected number that you put on this game based on the players, based on the expected lineups, based on the starting pitchers? What is the projected number that you come down to for that specific game? Streaks happen. Streaks are not predictive. It's just, it's a thing that people love to ride. Mm -hmm. You look at teams who have gone on long winning streaks, long losing streaks. There's nothing actually predictive about them. Their hitters may all be hitting better at the same time. Maybe their bullpen is all struggling at the same time, but by and large, all these players should regress to their baseline and their projections. So what is the number for this specific game? As BJ said, from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m., 2 a.m., I'm grinding out where I think the number should be, shopping for the best available lines, and then betting my perceived edges. Once the day flips over in the morning, I'm readjusting for weather, readjusting for expected umpires, maybe some injury news updates. Typically, I have 10 to 15 bets overnight, and then I'll add about 10 more bets in the morning before games. And then as we get closer to the games, I'll recheck all my lines as lineups get announced before those slates start, whether there's 10 games at 7 p.m. and 5 at 10 p.m., or whether there's three each at 1 p.m., 4 p.m., 7 p.m., and 10 p.m. on a Saturday, for instance, where they're more spread out. So I'm constantly, constantly checking the lines. It is a never-ending process. People would be shocked at the amount of time that I dedicate just to looking at lines, making sure things haven't moved, double checking my process, double checking the numbers. It is completely exhausting, but that is what it requires if you want to get an edge on the sport. Now, it's interesting. You talk about how eventually things kind of go back to the back of the baseball card, right? There is a reason that that saying kind of exists in the first place. So Sean is not looking at if this guy's hitting 437 when there's a full moon outside on Thursdays, for example, as a trend. Um, BJ, you know, Sean outlined a lot of his process. What about yours? Is it similar both preseason and once we are in the kind of marathon that is the boys of summer? Yeah, I'd say me and Sean see things and project things or not, not, you know, not necessarily project, you know, the same exact model, but see things in a very similar light. I agree with him that looking at what other people have in terms of win totals, division futures and everything like that is crucial to actually betting those futures. You know, if you're only betting based on what you have, well, you have no indicator to know if that's right or not. So it comparing that to what other people have is very, very crucial to see if what you're actually projecting is correct, because that's the biggest thing is I can have a projection model and I can have all these wonderful things, but if it's not profitable and it's not making any money over a long run, it's useless. So comparing that and even on an individual basis, you know, every single day I compare to what Sean has for his projected lines, you know, to make sure that I'm within a, a a good range in terms of my projections as well. But yeah, the grind for me is very similar to what it is for Sean, you know, working on a, a number of different sports here at the action network, it does become exhausting to, you know, we get betting baseball, college football, soccer, all these different things at once constantly checking lines. I laugh because when Sean says I'm constantly double checking lines, like I feel like I'm in the action network app every single day, right. constantly rechecking every single line to make sure that, Oh, did something become available or come within range of what my, you know, expected outcome is what I have on a projection and things like that. So yeah, it's a never ending process of rechecking, double checking and figuring out, do I have value on this game? And like Sean said, you have to do these things. If you want to turn a profit in baseball, you don't just, you know, for example, I can go overnight and project things and just bet them and forget about them and figure out, you know, what happens later. But if I'm not constantly rechecking and double checking those things, then I'm missing potential opportunities to make, to get more bets in and, and give myself a better chance at getting that three to three and a half percent edge over a season versus just putting five bets in the app because I have value on those and just ignoring everything until the game starts. So again, like Sean said, it's a never ending process of projecting, finding all the available information that you can on these teams 
and then hopefully turning a profit in that given day or a given week and in a given year. And you get it, you get a feel for it eventually. You know, you may project out your lines well in advance, bet a team at a certain price, and then you see closer to game time, oh, why their line raised by 10 cents. Why, why did they go from plus 100 to plus right. 110? I assume Byron Buxton is out of the lineup for the Twins because mm-hmm. they rest him on random days. So you kind of get a feel eventually if the line hasn't moved for eight hours and then all of a sudden closer to game time, it jumps 10 cents. Oh, there must be a change in the lineup. You can't just go off of your projection from last night. You have to readjust it. Right. I re-upload it to the Action Network website, into the app. You get those updated lines. I refresh those constantly throughout the day. So you do get a feel for it over time when the line hasn't moved for hours and hours, why it might suddenly move. It's probably due to line of information. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing both of these guys are doing, and I recommend you do as well, is check the Action Network app as much as possible. Unless, of course, you are allergic to money. One thing I want to ask both of you guys is Major League Baseball has really evolved over the last few years in a number of ways, right? We hear about launch angle and three true outcomes. We hear about the specialization of bullpens and pitchers going shorter and shorter into games. How have these kind of evolutions in the game changed your way of looking at maybe strikeout props, totals, or any other opportunities to bet in Major League Baseball? Well, I don't know if it's really changed my approach so drastically. I mean, I know we have more teams who seem to be top heavy and more teams who seem to be kicking the can from the, the moment that the season starts. You know, the there's a wider range of outcomes in these teams. There's going to be more 100 loss teams probably in 2022 than there have been in some time. So it really does change on a year to year basis. But that said, I'm still using very similar stats to stats that I've used in the past few years expected stats. I know, Dane, you said teams tend to regress. Players tend to regress towards their stats on the back of the baseball card. For me, it's players tend to regress towards the stats on their stat cast page. Things mm-hmm. like expected WOBA, their expected ERA. I view batted ball data as sort of these new age predictive indicators that people aren't fully versed in yet. Uh-huh. And if you really want to get an edge on the market, become more familiar with these predictive stats that are based yeah, off of strikeouts, it. walks, and batted ball data. Get that Babbitt, baby. Absolutely. BJ, what about you? Anything like, I'm thinking about home run props, K props, or anything else that have really changed as we've seen a new style of play in this game and a new way that managers are even managing the game? Yeah, I think it's just the availability of these type of advanced metrics. You know, it's sites like Baseball Savant and then fan graphs and everything. We can see these type of stat cast you know, things that we haven't seen necessarily in the past. Like Sean, it hasn't really changed much from my projection standpoint. If anything, maybe I'm paying closer attention to how many innings a pitcher is projected to go, depending on if he's an opener, if he guy is only a guy who goes three and a half, four innings, or if he's an actual legit starting pitcher that a manager is going to let go potentially five or six innings. So that from a projection standpoint, that's probably maybe the only thing that's changed from how managers utilize pitchers, starting pitchers on a day-to-day basis But yes, using a lot of these advanced metrics that are now more available to the public and for free, I think does help betting K props, home run props, you know, total base props, everything like that, you know, actually seeing what a pitcher's pitch arsenal is, you know, and does he have, you know, some negative regression coming on certain pitches? You know, if you go to baseball savant, they can tell you a pitcher's Woba and expected Woba on his fastball. And there could be a hundred point difference between what, he's expected to allow on his fastball from what he's already allowed. And also we can see exactly what pitches hitters are hitting well against, you know, what's their stat cast numbers are against that. What's their expected weighted on base average. What's their, you know, expected slugging percentage on all these different types of pitches to potentially get an edge on the market from a prop standpoint, whether it be home runs, total bases or anything else. So you got to become familiar with these types of advanced metrics. You have to, dig as deep as possible as you can to actually beat the market on a lot of these different types of props. But again, from an overall projection standpoint on an individual game, not a lot has changed since all of these advanced metrics have become available over the last five or 10 years. You know, one thing that has definitely grown 
over the last few years, it, people live betting. And in Major League Baseball, it is absolutely no different. I think betting Major League Baseball live is incredible. For example, I think they're completely undervaluing the ghost runner at the start of extra innings. You can get totals in the top of the eighth that completely undervalue if the game goes to extra innings and they put up a picket fence. You can understand when a pitcher is going through the lineup for the third time and may be more likely to give up runs. There's stats out there that show the fifth and sixth innings are when runs are mostly scored, you know? So what are some of the kind of rules of thumb or things that you have found betting major league baseball live, Sean? So it's all about timing for me. And we talked about bullpen availability before you definitely need to know which pitchers are going to be available. If certain teams, you know, ACE reliever is out for that particular night and there's a big drop off relative to their other pitchers, but buying large for me, when I'm looking at live entries on the money line or for spreads, it's all about timing. I'm waiting for the lineup to flip to the top of the order for the team mm -hmm. that I want to back. Hopefully I'm betting against the bottom of the order for the team who I'm trying to bet against, but I want to bet when my team is pitching, I want to bet jumping on a team who is about to pitch as opposed to a team who's going to hit because I want the better number right. from there. You basically need to hope that they get a scoreless inning. And then you're on the right side of the line because it's like betting tennis. When you live bet tennis, you want to bet when the other guy is serving the guy you want to bet against is serving as opposed to when your guy is serving, because you don't want to bank on that hold. You want to bank on the break from the other player. So you are going to better, get a better number right before your team is pitching that you want to back. But I usually look to bet it when I'm betting against the bottom of the lineup for the team I'm betting against. And then on the other side in the, the next half inning, when the team I'm backing is going to have the top of their lineup coming up, even if it's eight, nine, one or nine, one, two in the order, as opposed to the first three hitters, that's basically how I'm trying to time my live entries. BJ, what about you? Because, you know, another thing that makes baseball different than some other sports like basketball or hockey, where there's fluid live action is you will see lines changing literally batter by batter, pitch by pitch. So you have an opportunity if you so choose to take a stance mid rally and, you know, and actually take a position. Oh, this guy will get out of the jam with a double play ball and then see a dramatic change if they get out of that half inning. I know that's something some betters like to try to take a position on in the middle of a rally what are some of the things you do to bet major league baseball live yeah i totally agree with sean you need to definitely get a team if you're betting against a team you need to basically get them towards the bottom of their order if you're betting on a team i want the top of their order coming up you mentioned at the top you know most of the runs in major league baseball scored in the fifth and sixth inning well it's become a big thing and it became a huge thing in the world series two years ago when the rays were playing the dodgers when uh kevin cash took blake snell out because he was going to face the order for the third time. So that's Dodgers another thing. If I'm getting the, <laughs> yeah. If I'm getting the top of the lineup facing a starting pitcher, you know, and relatively it depends on the starting pitcher, you know, if they're facing Jacob DeGrom, he's a unique pitcher in the fact that he actually gets better the third time through the order. But if you're facing a normal, you know, average everyday MLB starting pitcher and they're facing the lineup the third time, you're going to get a drastic edge on that type of team, especially if you're getting the top of the order up. And I totally agree with Sean, you definitely need to know, exactly who is who is in and who is out for the bullpens because that is mm -hmm. ultimately crucial and honestly knowing bullpen statistics is also yep. a big thing if you want to live bet baseball for example if you're betting you know the Kansas City Royals have one of the worst bullpens in major league baseball this That's year right. so if if you're betting uh on them and they take a big time lead against whoever the team is well it's more likely their bullpen is going to implode towards the end than actually see the game out so you can bet spreads and get better odds potentially there so knowing the bullpens, getting the top of the order, you know, pitchers third time through the lineup. There's so many things you can do to actually live at Major League Baseball and eventually, hopefully, turn a profit. Yeah, knowing that bullpen data is absolutely huge when you have a team with a really bad bullpen or whose main horses may not be available that night and they've got a one or two run lead in the sixth or seventh inning, you can get decent plus money on the other side to be sure. Well, let me get you out of here, guys, on this. You know, we're talking about betting baseball and we're talking about that as a grind, as a marathon, but there's obviously a lot of joy and ups and, you know, kind of adrenaline that comes from it as well. So, Sean, let me start with you. Like, what's 
what's kind of your favorite or best sweat from betting Major League Baseball? Is it identifying when, you know, a lowly team is going to get hot and reel a couple off at plus 235? Or is it finding that team that is down three runs in the six, but you want to kind of fade the bullpen they're playing against? What's sort of like the ultimate thrill for you for betting Major League Baseball? Or is it identifying one of those teams that you thought was going to come from the clouds from a big future number? I definitely love to bet futures and nailing something like a home run leader prop, even if they're just in the hunt for it, I think is a lot of fun for me. That's how I started out betting. That's what first caught my attention. And it definitely still makes my juices flow. But at this point, the amount that I'm betting, the volume that I'm betting at, knowing as long as I have a solid process, when I'm getting the solid results too, when I'm getting CLV and winning games, getting that good process, good result overlap. That is the actual thrill for me because you can have a good process and get bad results. You can have Mm -hmm. a bad process and get good results, or you could get the bad process and the deserved bad results. But when you have the good process, when you're consistently generating closing line value, beating these lines by five to 6%, and you're actually going on a sustained winning streak for four weeks, six weeks, racking up 20 to 30 units, and just consistently building day after day after day. That brings me the most joy because I know I have a refined process. It is a big market. Baseball is a very difficult sport to bet because it is one of the major sports. And in the middle of the summer, when there is no other game in town and people who normally bet football, who may have some sharp inside information on baseball from other people who model it and they want to take some of their action when they're putting their money in the market too. And the baseball market has a ton of money in it. It is a very sharp market. The closing lines are very indicative of what's going to happen. I don't care where it opened, but where it closed. So as long as I can take those opening numbers, beat them and beat the close by 20 cents, 25 cents, and I'm getting good results, that actually fills me with confidence and brings me a lot of joy because I know that I have a sound process. I've proved it over the course of multiple years, but sometimes as BJ said, we go through huge downswings. You may be beating the lines, but not getting the results. And that's where it gets very frustrating because you know, you're probably on the right side of the move. You're just not getting the desired outcome. So good process, good results is always what I want to see. You know, it's CLV. Yeah, you know me. BJ, uh, do you think the same? You trusting the process? Is that what brings you great joy as well? Yeah, to echo off what Sean said, you know, good process, good results is the best feeling possible. So for example, you know, this season, I've already mentioned it once, but the Pirates swept the Dodgers and they were plus 200 above every single game they were showing value every single game those are the type of outcomes where it's oh my gosh you know we might only get a few of those a week you know going over a long stretch but getting them all in a short amount of time that feels great but yes like sean said basically turning a profit over a long run getting a good process getting a good results from a good process is the best feeling possible. So this has been another edition of the Experts Guide to Betting on Major League Baseball. Of course, the first thing you should do is download the Action Network app, subscribe to the Action Network YouTube channel so you could see all of Sean and BJ's picks, leans, and plays. And we'll be back another time for another in our series of the Experts Guides to Betting here on the Action Network. (laughs) 